Thank you. Good to be with you. And uh, actually, I, yeah, we'll get this going. Actually, I came over from Topeka to Manhattan, then to here. So I had to leave my place north of Topeka about 6 a.m. to go teach the 8 a.m. class at K-State and then come here. And, uh, so it's good to be with you. Great turnout. Appreciate that. And uh, you're catching me. I spent the two-hour drive down here from K-State on the phone because you know what tomorrow is. It's the filing deadline. And so everybody's got an emergency that they want to talk to me about. And so that was all the way down. It's going to be all the way back. All these last minute questions concerning uh, tax filing issues for farmers. Uh, I want to just show you this real quick. Uh, Washburn is the law school for Kansas. And these are all of the courses that a student can take at Washburn that has something to do with agriculture. Look at that list. I could show you that I, I could put the slide in the deck as to what uh, the ag courses that they teach at KU Law, but that would be a blank white screen, and that's kind of boring. <laughs> so we won't do that. But uh, <laughs> I, I teach. I don't teach all of these. I can't possibly teach all of them. Uh, now I don't teach them in the classroom. I do teach them across the country, coast to coast. I do about 100 events a year. Uh, I did 115 last year coast to coast in 27 states and I'll be, uh, I'm off the road next week but then I'll be in Indiana for a series of seminars the following week on things like this. Uh, let me ask you this, how many of you have heard my, the, my national daily syndicated radio show? The two minute one, okay good, a number of you have heard that. Uh, I talked about a water issue today, if you heard that there was something unique that happened in the Nevada Supreme Court. Uh, and so that was the issue today. So all things agricultural law and tax, uh, it's called the Agricultural Law and Tax Report. I'm sure there's a station in Hutch that picks it up. I have 85 stations across the state of Kansas, 285 nationwide, plus Sirius XM, channel 147. So keep listening uh, for that. And those of you who aren't aware of it, um, catch it, you can catch it on a farm radio station probably near you. Okay, let's talk about Kansas fence law. And uh, besides, if I were to take tax out of the equation, tax and estate planning, succession planning, the two biggest issues that I get questions on are fences and leases. Clearly, fences and leases are the biggest once you get past tax. Tax is number one uh, by a long shot. But then fences and leases after tax and estate planning and all of that. So the primary issues that we have with rural fences to, to start out here and kind of summarize where we're going would be what is a partition fence because that has a special meaning and it has certain requirements that come along with being a partition fence, construction and maintenance issues, liability for damages caused by state escaped livestock, and I just learned in the introductions that we have a couple of people known as fence viewers here today, whether they like it or not. Uh, fence viewers, and then how we handle stray animals. So those are kind of the, the major issues that I'll be touching on in the next four or five hours. <laughs> oh, I didn't know there was a time limit. Is there a time limit on this? No? Oh, okay. Well, at least you're paying attention. Okay, good. So, what is a partition fence? Let's start with that issue. Well, a partition fence is a fence that is on the partition. Uh, it's to be placed on the line between tracts of land owned by different persons. Now notice what I didn't say. I didn't use the word boundary. I said partition. Okay, usually a partition is on the boundary, but then we get boundary issues, and so is it being treated as a partition fence? I'll clarify that in just a bit as we go. But it can be located entirely on one side of the boundary. So that's why a partition fence can be technically different from a boundary fence. But it can become, if it's not on the boundary, the surveyed boundary, the legal boundary, and those don't have to be the same, it can become the actual boundary by passage of time and the adjacent owner has, over that time, come to believe the fence actually marks the boundary. And it doesn't matter what the deed or survey says. So that's one of the areas we're going to get into. I've got a deed or survey that says the boundary is here. Well, we've been using it over here. One party has been. Well, if that usage has continued for a long enough period of time that's defined by state law, and that differs from state to state, 
and that person believes that that fence that's in the that misplaced fence marks the boundary then that can become the actual legal boundary irrespective of what the deed or the survey says now in ag that's a real issue because usage of property may determine a boundary more often than a survey does i've had that happen numerous times some as well i have a survey our response to that in ag is oh, that's, that's nice so you have a survey what's the usage of the property been that's the key issue what's been the usage and how long has been has the usage been that particular way so this gets us into the first issue associated with that known as adverse possession i'm sure you've heard about adverse possession the landowner under the adverse possession theory can acquire or I should say may landowner may acquire title to property by making an open and notorious use of the property for 15 years the statute in kansas is a 15-year statute so an open and notorious use so that means it's obvious to the public that you are using that disputed area and nobody has stopped you the true owner has not stopped you from using that area they know you're over on them you know you're over on them and you know your usage is adverse to their interest and they just haven't done anything about it so this rule applies when the adjacent parties know that existing fence is not on the boundary we know that fence is not in the right place and I'm going to continue. It's too far over on my neighbor, but I'm going to take advantage of that. And they don't stop me from doing that. Then after 15 years of that misuse, I can file a quiet title action in the county district court and have title to that disputed area quieted in me. So this again applies when the parties know that the existing fence is not on the boundary and one party benefits by that misplaced fence. So here are the elements. To adversely possess a property in Kansas, you must have openly, exclusively, and continuously been in possession of the real estate, knowingly adverse to the true property owner. I could substitute in here, no, um, possession of the disputed area, knowingly adverse to the true property owner. So the adverse possession applies when both parties know that the existing fence is not on the boundary line and that one party is using that other party's property. And if you don't stop them from doing that uh, for 15 years, then the other party can actually claim title to that. Let me give you a case on that. This is the Peterson case, Peterson against Siebert, last, uh, well not last year, two years ago in the Kansas Court of Appeals. The plaintiffs were the eighth owners of a home purchased in 2003. The home was built in the 1980s. So this thing had constantly uh, turned over quite a bit. There was a chain link fence in the backyard installed by the prior owner in the 1980s. At purchase, the disclosure document indicated the fence was on the property line. There was no mention of a survey. It just said that chain link fence is on the property line. The plaintiffs maintained the property up to the fence, sometimes going beyond the fence. They removed the fence in 2018 along with a shed, but continued to maintain the property up to where the fence had been. So they took the shed out, uh, they took the fence out, continued to maintain the property up to where the fence had been. The adjacent owner requested a survey which showed that the fence line encroached on the adjacent owner's lot, which they purchased in 2020. Now what do you do? Note the dates here. Um, this was, home was purchased in 2003. Uh, lo and behold, they removed the fence 15 years later. They continue to maintain the property up to that. You've got a survey and the adjacent owners had come in and purchased their side in 2020. Now we're 17 years past this ownership here when that started. The plaintiffs brought a quiet title action in September of 2020. Now remember the plaintiffs were these additional these these initial homeowners here that that owned, maintained the property I should say up to the fence and then took the fence out along with the shed but continued to maintain the property up to where the fence had been so they bring a quiet title action claiming title by adverse possession to what well this disputed area because the fence line according to the survey showed it was on the adjacent owner's property so they're claiming ah oh, we've got an additional strip here we'll go ahead and claim that we know the 15-year statute that should be ours trial court said no 
you didn't have a reasonable belief of ownership during that 15 year period. You just learned that when the survey happened. You had to have a knowingly adverse possession for 15 years. You didn't have that until there was actually a survey done. You just assumed that was on the line. You didn't know where the line was. That is correct. That's the right way for the courts to analyze this. And that was affirmed on appeal. The plaintiffs knew there was no proof that the fence marked the property line due to a lack of a survey. They only had constructive notice. Uh, they had some knowledge that the fence line might not be the property line, but that's not enough. Okay? So that was a recent case on adverse possession. We had another one in 2022 on a disputed boundary line, the Pile Against Gall case. Plaintiff routinely planted crops up to what the plaintiff believed was the line. But that interfered with the defendant's, tenant's, crop farming activities. So he's farming up to what he thinks has been the line that's interfering with the adjacent owner's tenant and their farming practices. The plaintiff also used a portion of the defendant's field as, ac as an access road to the plaintiff's field. So we've got two things going on here. The, this really gets juicy. We've got a dispute over a boundary line, and then we've got an easement, an access easement. So we've got them all mixed together in this one. The defendant offered to, to solve this problem. He said, hey, look, I want to be nice. I'll just sell you the disputed area. And you, you stop accessing my field uh, by this easement area. I'll just sell that to you. Why don't we do that? Sounds like a reasonable solution, right? What do you suppose the other party said to that? No, I want to keep causing problems for you. So I don't want to buy it from you. I want to take it from you by adverse possession. See, that's cheaper to do. Uh, won't have to pay for it. So they end up spending not just a little bit of money, but a lot of money. We're going to start by hiring surveyors. And then, of course, we're going to end up in court. We get to pay lawyers. That's good. Okay. Yeah. So on what could have been just a little dispute here, we'll pay just for this strip of land. We're going to pay a whole bunch of money, and we're going to fight, and we're going to just mess up the whole community. That's, that's just great. Uh, and look what the surveyors came up with. The surveyors, the surveys didn't agree. <laughs> now you've got a real mess. The next spring, the defendant built a fence on the property line according to his survey. Oh boy. 17 feet onto what the plaintiff believed was the property line. The next spring, the plaintiff sued to quiet title of the field up to the crop line by adverse possession, and he sought an easement. Okay, so now we got two issues before the court. The trial court said the plaintiff had adversely possessed the disputed area and had acquired an easement by prescription. The plaintiff wins on both issues. The appellate court affirmed on the adverse possession issue. They said, yeah, you met the 15 year requirement. It was open, it was continuous, it was obvious. You knew that the, where the boundary was, you, you were claiming that open um, as adverse to the true owner. That's fine. Reversed on the prescriptive easement issue because there was no exclusive use of the easement. You let other people use the easement too, an easement has to have exclusive use for the party that has the easement. And there were multiple people that were using that. And so the case was sent back to the trial court on the easement issue as to whether it's an easement by what we call necessity. Trial court hadn't considered that issue, so they had to go back and determine whether it was an easement by necessity. And what that means is if you've got a landlocked tract, uh, the law will imply an easement so that you have access to get to a field to farm it, or if you have a house back in there, you're going to have an easement by necessity to get there. And so that, that issue hadn't been considered by the trial court, and so the appellate court sent it back for consideration of that. Uh, but they didn't, they, there was no exclusive use to grant them a an easement by prescription, maybe one by necessity. Okay. Uh, so this goes on to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed the appellate court on the prescriptive easement issue. And they said, now wait a minute, there's no exclusivity requirement as to the public, only as to the specific use. And so they said, if these other people that were using that easement area were using it for the same reason that it was being used by the party to the lawsuit, then that's okay. Uh, there's no exclusivity requirement as to the public, so others can use it. It's just, are they using it for the same purpose? 
The easement it was granted for an access purpose. If others were using it, other family members is what it was for the access, then that doesn't defeat the easement, the prescriptive easement. So an interesting case on a couple of issues that got intertwined went all the way to the Kansas Supreme Court two years ago. Now sometimes we get an issue about tacking. Tacking is the issue that comes up, of course, we have this 15-year statutory requirement. Do I have to satisfy the 15 years myself, or if I've got seven or eight years, but the previous owner had seven or eight years, can I use their period of usage, their ownership and usage, and tack it onto mine to get to the 15? That's what tacking is. Well, you can satisfy the 15-year requirement by tacking. Again, 2022 was the big year in this state for these property issues hitting the courts. We had a Kansas Court of Appeals opinion in 2022 where the survey revealed that the fence was on the plaintiff inside the surveyed boundary. So the fence is in on the plaintiff, survey boundary is over here, the fence is inside, and the plaintiff sued to have the survey established as the boundary. Move it over, I want more land here. The defendant counterclaimed to establish a fence line as a boundary by adverse possession. Okay, so they're disputing over this. Do we follow the survey? Do we have adverse possession? And the defendant won. He had eight years of ownership. Previous owner had seven. That got him to 15. There was no interruption, no abandonment, and there was a good faith belief for those entire 15 years on the part of the prior owner and the existing owner. That gets you to the 15. And the case was affirmed by the Court of Appeals. The fence was in place when the defendant bought, the tr bought that tract. And that's, that's key to this. The fence was in place and they could prove by the evidence that the prior owner had treated the fence as the boundary for eight years or seven years and you can tack yours on and once you get to 15 total, then you can have adverse possession in that situation. So a good case on the tacking issue. Okay, now the twin of this uh, doctrine, kind of the flip side of the coin, is doctrine of practical location. What I said with adverse possession is that the parties know where the line is and one party is possessing over onto the other party and that party knows that that's going on, it's open, it's continuous, and after 15 years then title can be quieted in the adverse possessor to the disputed area. The flip side of that is where, when you don't know where the boundary is at. You can still have adverse possession under a different doctrine. This is known as the doctrine of practical location. So this applies whether the parties know the existing, or when, I should say, when the parties know the existing fence is not on the boundary, but don't know where the boundary is located. We know that fence is not in the right spot, don't know where the boundary is. After 15 years, the usage of the fence in that location can become the boundary. So you didn't know where the boundary was, but you just treated that fence, that existing fence, which is not on the line, you just farmed up to it on one side, farmed onto it on the other side, that can actually become the legal boundary. It doesn't matter what the survey says in that instance. Usage is the key. So what if a boundary is in dispute because of conflicting surveys? Well, any boundaries and markers set by the first survey control in a conflict with a subsequent survey. And that is true even if there are errors in the original survey. The first survey controls. We've had cases on that in Kansas. Always consider how the land has been affected by the original survey's location in the boundary. So if you have a fence that's on the old but erroneous boundary or survey line and the parties have been farming to the line, don't move the fence. That's the first point on this one. So consider how the land has been affected by the original survey's location of the boundary. If that fence is on the old but erroneous survey line and the parties have been farming to the line, don't move the fence. If the fence doesn't follow either the original survey or the later survey, the true boundary line may need to be designated. So we get into some of those issues. But those are the two basic principles with respect to a boundary being in dispute because of conflicting surveys. Those are the two main points with respect to that. Now, next issue, building and maintaining fences, partition fences, the equal share rule. Equal does not mean in halves, so that's, that's different. Halves is not the same thing as equal. 
The statute says, so long as the parties continue to occupy or improve such lands unless otherwise agreed, then adjacent landowners bear an equal burden of building and maintaining the fence, okay, under the equal share rule. It doesn't mean the cost is going to be borne equally by the parties, okay. It doesn't mean that a length of fence, it, we're going to split that equally. Okay, I'll show you what this means in just a second. You can modify that rule by agreement, so we can always have a contract between the landowners and contractually agree how we're going to repair a fence or how we're going to build a fence, and that may be totally different than the equal share rule. We can always do that. And we can enter the neighboring land at reasonable times and in a reasonable manner to maintain the fence. Now, reasonability is a fact-based determination. So that depends on the facts as to what's reasonable in each particular situation. In other words, it's not a trespass if you're building and maintaining a fence, if you're on your neighbor's side of the fence while you're rebuilding a fence or building a fence or maintaining a fence, that's your responsibility to do so. The reality is the right-hand rule. This is what most people will use. So if I have a land that adjoins my neighbor, we meet mid part of the fence, I fix what's on my right as we face each other, he or she fixes what's on their right. We're all familiar with that rule. That's the reality, that's common practice as to what's done. But again, that's not required by statute. Statute is the equal share rule. Now, is there a written fence agreement? Well, I always wanna start there. I've seen very few of these over the years. I have seen them, but there are very few of them. You can enter into an agreement with your neighbor as to how we're gonna fix fence, well, who's responsible for what. We can record it in the land records in the county. And that will bind not only the current owners, but also all subsequent owners. That's a great way to get around these fence disputes. But there are very few fence agreements that are actually entered into and show up on land records. And not very many of them out there. Okay, so let's apply the, the rules uh, in, under Kansas law. F various theories here, a couple of theories. Common law approach, which is the Kansas approach, is if I fail to keep my livestock on my property, I'm potentially subject to liability. That's known as the fence-in theory. I'm responsible to fence in my livestock. Okay? I'm responsible to make sure that they are fenced in. Other states, primarily out west, further west, require landowners to construct fences around their property to fence out trespassing livestock before damages can be collected. So if you don't want my animals on your property, you're responsible for putting up a fence to keep my animals out. That's most likely what you're gonna see in the, the western states, the open range states, those types of things. That's not Kansas. So in that type of a jurisdiction, if livestock trespass, Within a lawful enclosure, the owner is strictly liable for the damages, no proof of negligence is necessary. So if my neighbor puts up a fence to keep my animals out and my animals get in there, I'm responsible, period. It's not an issue of negligence, I am responsible. So that's kind of the trade-off for a very favorable rule for livestock owners. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be responsible if my animals break through somebody else's enclosure and cause damage. So we have to keep our animals fenced in. It's unlawful under Kansas law for any livestock to run at large, but there's a limitation and we're back to, to that equal share rule. So what if a livestock owner shares a partition fence with a crop farmer or other landowner that doesn't graze livestock? This is where we get most of the questions under the Kansas provision because this gets a little bit confusing. We've got a livestock owner on one side of a partition fence We've got a crop farmer or somebody that doesn't graze livestock on the other side of the fence. Who's responsible for building and maintaining the fence? Well, what's the first principle? Kansas is a fence-in jurisdiction, so who's responsible for keeping their animals in? The livestock owner is, okay? So the question that I get all the time comes from the non-livestock owner that says, I don't need the fence, I don't want to pay for a part of this fence. I don't want to split the cost with my neighbor. He or she's got livestock. They need to fence it in, right? What's my response? Wrong. I say, what? well, you just said it's a fence in jurisdiction. Yes, it is a fence in jurisdiction. However, it's an equal share rule. Well, I don't have animals. 
you're still responsible for an equal share of the total cost of building or maintaining that fence. Oh. Then the next question, sometimes I get this one. Well, I, I understand that, but my neighbor wants to put this elaborate, really expensive fence up, and uh, I don't want to share the cost of that. Do I have to? No. No. They want to go way beyond what a lawful fence is. You know, they, they want that wire to be gold-plated. <laughs> I have to pay for half of that? No. But you are responsible for a portion of the, the half of the total cost, basically, but of what a lawful fence is. So, what if a livestock owner, back to the question here, we are fence in, but what if a livestock owner shares a fence with a crop farmer and the crop farmer doesn't want to share equally in the cost of building and maintaining the fence? Anybody been there with that issue? Yeah? The rest of you don't want to admit. Yeah. How many of you don't like raising your hands at meetings? <laughs> and you still didn't raise your hands on that. <laughs> well, if you don't do that as the crop farmer, then you're barred recovering damages if, the lice, if your neighbor's animals get out uh, and damage your crops. Okay, so that kind of limits the fence in theory. And you can be responsible to others for trespassing livestock damage. Oh, so I really should participate in building and maintaining that fence. Now, you can't be forced to build or pay for an equal share of a partition fence if, if and this is from the crop owner's perspective, the non-livestock owner's perspective, you can't be forced to build or pay for an equal share of a partition fence if the adjoining tracks are used in common, in other words, for the same purpose, so we've got crops on both sides. This is the only situation where this statute would work, and it's a weird way the legislature worded this. By the way, the fence statutes in this state are pretty old. You want to guess how old? Yeah, statehood, basically. Yeah, and they have not changed much. We've got little nuances here and there, but they rarely change. So we've got, uh, let's say, crops on both sides. And there's no fence, and one party says, I don't want to put a fence in. Well, the other crop farmers says, well, I don't need a fence. We know where the line's at. I don't want to pay for a fence. Okay, so one party doesn't want a partition fence. <coughs> and the adjoining tracks are used to grow crops. So we've got that situation in my example. So if we've got that, then the party that doesn't want the fence cannot be forced to build or pay for an equal share of the partition fence because the usage on both sides is the same. It's crops and crops. The person that wants the fence in that situation, it's their 100% responsibility. So the statute, according to the Attorney General in Kansas, now this is 40 years ago, Statute only applies to relieve a landowner from the responsibility for sharing equally the cost of building and maintaining a partition fence when the land is used in common, same usage on both sides, and the complaining party does not want the fence. So then you're relieved from contributing to the fence. But if it's crops and cattle, then there, it, this doesn't apply. And the party that doesn't have the livestock bears an equal share of the total cost of building and maintaining that fence. That is probably the most confusing part of the Kansas statute. Kansas fence law is very, very favorable to the livestock industry. It always has been. So if I don't have livestock, my neighbor has livestock, and it's a partition fence, I'm equally responsible with my neighbor for building and maintaining that fence even though Kansas is a fence-in jurisdiction. That's a limitation on the fence-in theory. So what if the parties can't agree? Forget that, I don't like the rule. Parties cannot agree on fence building or maintenance. What do you do? Is it dueling? Pacing things off? Fire? Guns? That has happened. There are cases out there. Yeah, we'll solve this once and for all. Uh, not the preferred way. We've had a lease, farm lease situation in Iowa that ended up in murder. 
guy buried the other guy down a cistern. Ended up life in prison. Yeah, don't do that kind of But fences and leases can be hot issues like that. Okay. Well, uh, you negotiate a fence agreement, have it recorded. That'll solve it. We'll enter it, we'll do this contractually. Think that happens very often? No. But you can, you could do that. We could, we could just work it out, we'll come to an agreement, we'll record that on the land records. Or we resolve the matter privately. Most of the time, they agree not to agree, so they call the fence viewers. Okay? And as happened in Shawnee County a number of years ago, there was a front page picture, an article in the Topeka Capital Journal. This was probably almost 30 years ago, and I still have the clipping someplace, of a lady that got elected to the Shawnee County Commission and had absolutely no idea that one of the duties of a county commissioner was to be a fence viewer. So the picture on the front page of the Topeka Capital Journal was this um, really uh, fancy dressed up lady in high heels doing a fence view stepping around cow patties. That was the picture in the paper. She said, I had no idea I had to do this. Okay, well, you know, be careful what you run for. So you call the fence viewers, and that's the county commissioners or their designees in the county where the fence is located. Now you get some really interesting ones if the fence is located on a county border. There, in that situation, the chairman of each county board would be the fence viewers, and if they can't agree, then a third viewer is selected from the county, the fence, from the county fence viewers in the counties. So it, you have the chairman of the county board in each county, there'll be uh, the fence viewers. If they don't want to do that, then the statute says, well, then we're going to select a third viewer. If these parties don't agree, we're going to throw in a third one selected from the county fence viewers in the counties. And their decision has to be recorded in the land records of each county. Not just one county, but each county. Kind of makes sense. The decision of the fence viewers must be by majority vote. So they'll go out and make a fence view, reach a decision, and it has to be a majority. The commissioners can act as a board collectively or any two of them may be appointed. Okay, so I'm working my way through the statute here. They act upon application of a landowner for a view. So the landowner has to make application to the county board to re formally request a view. It won't happen until that happens. Now, I get this question a lot. The viewers only have jurisdiction over building and maintenance disputes, not boundary location. Fence viewers don't have anything to do with boundaries. That's a different issue. All the fence viewers are doing is they'll come out and determine who's responsible for building and maintaining what. Okay, not where the location of the fence is. They cannot order an existing fence to be moved. Sometimes they have to learn this after the fact by the courts telling them, no, you, you don't have jurisdiction over that, don't do that. It's just building and maintenance, that's it. After the view, the commissioners or the fence viewers will assign to each party in writing an equal share or part of the fence to build, maintain, or repair, and that decision is recorded in the County Register of Deeds office. Okay? If they're acting as fence viewers, now this is another nuance in the statute, meaning any two of them. If it's two of them, then they are acting as the fence viewers. They're not a board because they're acting as just two of them. Then their decision is final, conclusive, non-appealable, and binding on the parties and all succeeding occupants of the land. You're done. The process is done if it's just two of them acting because that's fence viewers. If the commissioners do not appoint any two of them, any decision is deemed to be a board decision. Ah, then the appeal rights are different if they're acting as a board. That triggers the normal appeal rules, which means notice of appeal if, the lander, if one of the landowners doesn't agree with what the board came up with in their allocation of responsibility. Then notice of appeal gets served on the board's clerk within 30 days. The appealing party has to provide a bond, pay necessary costs. And uh, if we have one party that's not abiding by the decision of the viewers, then the other party can erect, repair, or maintain the entire fence. Just go ahead and build the entire fence. 
and charge the non-performing party for its share of the cost of the fence. So I'm going to go build the whole fence and say it's $20,000. I'll send my neighbor a bill for 10 plus interest at a percent per month and attorney's fees if legal action is needed to collect. That's what the statute says. Well, the Supreme Court of Kansas had some things to say about that a few years ago. And this came out of Riley County. Kunze versus Schwartz back in 2001. Have you heard of this case? Every county commissioner needs to be aware of this case because this really changed a lot of things. And um, at the time, I've had two separate stints at K-State. This was my first stint and my wife and I and our children lived in northern Riley County uh, up you know, along Highway 16. And, uh, and North, this case comes out of North Riley County and Hal Kunze would come and see me uh, by like clockwork on every Saturday morning. I could almost tell, you know, he's coming down the long lane that we've got. My wife would say, well, I'll see you in a couple hours. Because uh, that's usually how long the conversations took. And um, he had a fence that bordered Schwartz's property. They both run cattle. And Northern Riley County is pretty rugged. And you got a lot of rocks, you got water, you got canyons, it's pretty rough. And this fence, the property line was in a really rough area and there's, one, there's a water gap. I would constantly blow out, cattle would get out all over the place and Schwartz didn't want to fix the fence. And so Hal was upset with this and he said, what, could I, what can I do? Um, I said, well, just go patch that, get the county commissioners up here to look at it and um, you guys are not going to agree. I was afraid they were going to shoot each other. Uh, so get the commissioners up there. So they did. They called the viewers. They made, they made the applicable, the correct procedure to request a view. Viewers made a decision. Schwartz didn't want to pay any attention to the decision. He said, I don't care what they say. Okay. So Hal, can I fix the fence? And I'm looking at the statute. The statute says you can fix the fence. And he needed to fix the fence because the cows were getting out all over the place. So you're going to have to fix the fence. And uh, he said Schwartz didn't want to pay the bill. So they end up in court. They go all the way through the court system. And here's the rule coming out of Kunze against Schwartz. So you call the viewers. This is the procedure now. Viewers make a decision. If you have one party that doesn't comply, then the, uh, the disaffected party, in this instance Kunze, has to call the county commissioners again, call the fence viewers again, come out and make a second view to determine that the fence needs build or repair. So you have the first view to make a determination of allocation of responsibility. One party doesn't follow that. Then the commissioners have to be called a second time to come out and determine, yeah, you know, you're right. What you told us, he's not fixing the fence there. I told you they weren't fixing the fence. Well, you got to call them out for the second view, and then they will allow the disaffected landowner to go ahead and build or maintain the fence. So you go ahead and do that. Then when you're done fixing the fence, you got to call the fence viewers again to come make a third view to certify the work that you did was in accordance with the decision that they had made the first time they came out. So that's what the court said you have to do. You have to make a third view to certify the work and the amount claimed due. That allows the party that went ahead and incurred the expense to repair the fence to send the bill to the other party. Three views is what's required by the fence viewer. Nightmarish, but there it is. And that came out of that case uh, in 2001. Okay, now back on this issue of what type of fence can be required. A legal fence. Okay? A legal fence is what's required. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, what is a legal fence? Well, it's what the county says a legal fence is. The county might follow the state law, but the county might have more stringent requirements than the state requirements. So if that's the case, you've got to follow what the county says. Okay? So it's a legal fence in the county. Now, what is a legal fence? Barbed wire with at least three wires, other types listed in the statute. Now, this is the state statute. At the discretion of the viewers, it could be a brook, a river, a creek, a ditch. Equivalent construction may be deemed to be a legal fence. County commissioners can enact more stringent legal fencing requirements on a countywide basis. 
So you can make it more strict in your county than what state law says. These other requirements are listed in state law. And there's a whole host of other things. I'm just mentioning the three-strand barbed wire fence here. Now, the statute says that it has to be a legal and sufficient fence. Those two are not necessarily the same. You could have a legal fence that's not a sufficient fence. What does sufficient mean? Sufficient is only determined in connection with what? Yeah, the livestock that it's supposed to re restrain. Right. Okay, are we talking hogs? Are we talking cattle? We could have a legal fence, but is it sufficient for the animals that it's intended to keep in? That's the key. So always remember, having a legal fence does not mean that a livestock owner will not be liable for damage as animals cause if they escape. Not having a legal fence is negligence. If you don't have a legal fence, then that's negligence. So having a legal fence is the minimum standard, but it's not necessarily a sufficient fence for livestock. You gotta have both. It has to be a legal and a sufficient fence. The case on this is back in 1961, Clark against Carson, where the court said, well, yeah, you do have a legal fence, meaning it meets the statutory requirement for a legal fence, but it's not a sufficient fence. And that case is still good law today. It has to be both. It has to be a legal fence meeting the statutory requirements. And even if it meets the statutory requirements, the question then is, does it keep the animals in that it is supposed to be keeping in? That's a sufficient fence if it is. So that issue often comes up with animals other than cattle. It can come up with respect to cattle, but it will often come up with respect to animals other than cattle. Okay. Hogs, bison, uh, captive deer, those types of situations. Okay. The situation is based on the facts. The point is, if a fence meets the requirements to be a legal fence, that's just the first step then it has to also be a sufficient fence to keep the animals contained in a fence in jurisdiction such as Kansas. So legal and sufficient. Those are the two requirements to have a proper partition fence in the state of Kansas. It has to meet both those requirements. And that, that's what the county commissioners should be looking at when they make their determinations in terms of building and maintenance of fence. Yes, it needs to be a legal fence in accordance with the rules that apply in the county. Secondly, it needs to be a sufficient fence, and that's tied to the type of animals that that fence is supposed to restrain. So it needs to meet both of those requirements. Now, what if animals get out? If livestock, if livestock escape a fence that is in good repair, the rule in Kansas is that the animal owner is generally not liable for any resulting damages. Absent the other party, the injured party, bearing the proof to prove that the animal owner was negligent. But you're not automatically liable if your animals get out, get on the highway, uh, somebody gets injured or killed. So what's evidence of negligence? The other party has to show you were negligent. You left gates open. They can show that. Or the fence was improperly constructed or maintained. Or you knew that you've got animals that are in heat and you didn't construct a stronger enclosure or something unique going on that the animals need a stronger enclosure. Or knowledge you knew your animals were out and you didn't do anything to put them back in. There are people like that out there. Okay. Iowa on that last point enacted a three strikes you're outlaw. If your animals get out the third time, you're criminally charged. It's a crime. Three strikes you're out. The reason that happened, which is the reason why we get often get legislation, is because a state senator in Iowa was disaffected by a neighbor who couldn't keep his cows and he got sick of it, so he got a bill passed through the legislature and the third time this guy's he's getting whacked criminally. That's exactly what happened. And it's the way often these laws get put together. We don't have that in Kansas, but that is evidence that you're negligent. And when again you have any of those that can cause you legal liability if your animals get out and cause damage, death, those types of things. The other party bears the burden to prove that though, and that's the key point in Kansas. 
Now, if animals trespass onto somebody else's property and cause damage, what you can do as the damaged party is retain the animals until payment is made for the damages, plus reasonable costs. Okay? I had this happen. I'm, I'm frequently gone. I had been on a three-week stint uh, all across the country, and I got back home, and my house is a quarter mile off the road, and wind your way back in. And I noticed I got in there, and at my pond were two steers. <clears throat> I don't have any steers. And uh, one of them was Longhorn. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, they tromped all the way down into the pond. I mean, they just had a wonderful time. Uh, it was a me the ground had been soft. It was an absolute mess. And then I get up closer to the house, and there's a third one in my wife's flower beds. Uh, just munching away. Uh, great. So I went out in the barn, roped them, tied them to the fence. Now I've got to figure out whose animals are these, because they're clearly not mine. Uh, and I know I've got 24 hours to, not to notify the owner. And once that notice is given, you can only hold them for five days without bringing legal action against the owner. Yeah, I skipped all of that. It's called the sheriff. He said, you got some of your stuff out here on my property. What do you mean, my stuff? Well, according to the statute, these are yours. I'm calling you to come get them. And just phrase it that way. And they came and got them. I uh, said, you know, come get your stuff. You're going to need a, a trailer or two to pick up your stuff. And he said, what are you talking about? Livestock. So the sheriff takes them, and it's the responsibility of the sheriff to figure out who the owner is. And the owner's got 10 days to reclaim and pay costs. If they're not reclaimed, they get sold at auction. Those, those got sold at auction. They couldn't figure out whose animals they were. Nobody wanted them. Okay. All right. Now... For strays, again, the sheriff has to be notified within 24 hours, and the party finding them, me in my instance, I get an adjuster's lien for feed and care costs, if I had incurred any. I didn't incur any. They came and got them right away. Okay? But you would get a lien, an adjuster's lien, for feed and care costs that you incur while they're in your possession. Now, how many of you have ever moved livestock down a public roadway? Okay. You know, um, the issue here, or the responsibility here, is you have to keep them under control. Any thoughts on that? Control on this, on this issue is a sometimes thing. Yeah, sometimes they're under control, sometimes they may not be under control. Um, but that's the issue in terms of liability. You are strictly liable, however, for any damages they cause while you're moving them on a public roadway. So there's right ways to do that, wrong ways to do that, but the issue is one of control. Do, are you keeping them under control? Oh, here's another one. Anybody ever had to deal with a railroad and fences? How'd that come out for you? The, my father-in-law got a letter from the railroad that said, under no certain circumstances shall you ever touch our fences again. Did they, did they take care of the problem? Yeah. Yeah, okay. How about over here? Did you have a good experience with the railroad? Oh, okay, yeah, we get into that issue too, on abandoned railroads. I mean an active line. Anybody having trouble communicating with the railroad that the, their fence needs to be repaired? Sometimes we get into that. The railroad is responsible for damages caused to livestock. Fault's not an issue. Railroad is responsible. Um, they can avoid liability by enclosing their tracks with fencing. And that's what they do. The adjacent landowners can require the railroad to enclose the right-of-way with lawful or hog-tight fences, whatever is a lawful and sufficient fence. Some states will fine railroads for refusing to build fences. Other states allow the landowner to be reimbursed for cost plus interest for building a fence. But the failure by a railroad to maintain a fence at a public road crossing makes the railroad liable unless the animals were on the track through a willful act of the owner. You know, here, I'm opening the gate, you go out, stand on the track, that kind of thing. That'd be willful. Don't do that. Now, let me give you a pointer here on how to get the railroad to take care of an issue with respect to a fence, actually with respect to whatever. Um, the place you contact, and I don't think I put this on the slide, 
No, I went to highway fences. All right. The way you get the railroad to act most quickly is this. You've got an issue with a, with a railroad fence. It's hard to figure out who to talk to in the railroad to get them to address the issue. You want to talk to their real estate office. So you want to figure out where the real estate office is, whether it's Union Pacific, Burlington, Northern Santa Fe, whatever the line is, figure out where the real estate office is. Uh, a lot of those in the eastern half of Kansas is going to be Kansas City. If it's Union Pacific, you're dealing with somebody in Kansas City. If you can figure out who the person is and get them to talk to you on the phone, that can be difficult to do. Here's the trick. What you do is you wait to see the maintenance people work on the line. And they're out there frequently. When you see them work on the line, adjacent to your property, you go out and you talk to them. You say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. They'll talk to you. And say, we got this issue here. Would you report it uh, to, the, to the main office in, in here uh, for Union Pacific, the Omaha? Um, tell them you got a safety issue. They'll get done like that. Report, have them report it as a safety issue. Now the maintenance guys don't care. They say, that's fine, that's what we get paid to do this, and the more safety issues we have, the more we get paid. So they don't care. And as soon as the main office hears that the track guys are reporting a safety issue, the order comes out, fix it, do whatever you need to do to fix the problem immediately. Bang, gets done. Okay, That's a little bit of inside baseball information. And it works. I had a county commissioner call me one time on that issue. It wasn't this county, it was a county northeast of here. And he, had, he said, we've been dealing with this issue for eight or nine months. He finally threw up his hands, called me, and said, here's what you do. Watch for the maintenance guys to just come up and down the line. Don't call anybody. They'll, they come through there periodically. He said, yeah, I do see them. And he called me back three weeks later and he said, problem solved. Saw the guys, went out, talked to them, said, would you call this in as a safety issue? Said, sure. They took care of it. He was dealing with the real estate office, and the real estate office kept telling him, that's not our responsibility. We're done with this crossing. We're not dealing with it anymore. So I said, well, try this. Report it as a safety issue. Bang, done. They are so sensitive on safety issues. And the, the maintenance guys, they're happy to do it. That's how they get paid. Okay? All right. Try that sometime. Okay, highway fences. The farmer is responsible for maintaining the inner fence. State, State Department of Transportation is responsible for maintaining the outer fence, and it's the land in between that causes issues, particularly with respect to weed control, because uh, you've got land inside two fences. Well, so that's a separate issue. So what responsibility does the state have to the motoring public with respect to building and maintaining highway fences? In other words, what does that highway fence have to be? Does it have to be a legal fence, a cattle-type fence? Does it have to be a legal and sufficient fence? And secondly, must they fence the entire road frontage of a particular parcel? In essence, the, the main question out of all of these is, what is the purpose of a highway fence? Is the purpose of a highway fence to keep animals in that are behind the fence, or is the purpose of a highway fence to restrict vehicular access to the roadway to certain points? What do you think the Department of Transportation's view in Kansas is with respect to their fences? Oh, it, it's only to restrict vehicular access to roads, so it doesn't have to be maintained necessarily to keep animals in. It just has to, you know, be so people aren't going to have access to the road at any given point. Okay, this issue went all the way to the Kansas Supreme Court. I'll come to that case in just a second. So let me, let me move on and then I'll come back to that. Public roads through private pastures. You may have this one. They may exist by authorization of the county commissioners. I don't know if you have any in the counties down here, uh, but a lot of counties will have these. You can permit, the county can permit a gate and fence to be placed across certain public roads cannot authorize locking of a gate that would bar the general public from accessing the road. So there needs to be an auto gate or a cattle guard. This is for these uh, public roads that are going through private property. So we see these in the Flint Hills, we see them out in western Kansas also, but they are in the Flint Hills. Okay, so back to the highway fence issue. 
Kansas Department of Transportation has a common law duty to keep the highways in a reasonably safe condition. That's the general principle, separate and apart from fence law, but it comes into play in, with respect to fence law. Common law duty to keep the highways in a reasonably safe condition. Um, how many of you have driven in Topeka recently? I think you could play golf in the city streets. You know, you know, 18 hole course every quarter mile. Just, where'd that ball go? Is in the hole. I, I think they've got some type of connection with the um, the body shops that repair shocks and well, it's a disaster this where you have to drive around the potholes but that's their common law duty to keep the highways in a reasonably safe condition the Reynolds case uh, if you've driven south out of Kansas City what is it on the Kansas side? highway 69 that goes down to Pittsburgh yes. okay that's now four lane pretty I think it's all the way down to Pittsburgh now uh, did not used to be, but they've continued to expand that. But coming out of Kansas City, it's been four lane for quite some time. With a median in the center, you get two lanes going north, two lanes going south. Okay, that's where this case came from. I was in Miami County, just south of Kansas City, and a tenant grazed cattle in a pasture on the west side of 69. So you got the southbound lanes, median, northbound lanes. Highway fence constructed by the KDOT was built up and around a double box culvert. Okay. The tenant fenced the mouth of the culvert, so this land is leased. The tenant has livestock out there. The tenant fenced the mouth of the culvert, so we have a highway fence. The tent, we have an inner fence that the tenant is responsible for. But the fence would wash out, the tenant's fence would wash out periodically and the cattle would escape to an orchard on the other side of the road. So they would escape, go through the culvert, go under the road, come up on the other side. The orchard on the other side has a highway fence that's in disrepair. And they walked out on the highway and um, you had somebody get killed. Car struck a cow on the road, killing one occupant, injuring another. All right, gets into court on a wrongful death action. Does the Kansas Department of Transportation have a statutory duty to maintain cattle tight fences? That's the first issue. Their argument is, oh, look, we're just restricting access to road entrances. We don't want people driving out onto the highway from a pasture or from a yard or something. That's why we have, we don't have to have a cattle tight fence. That's the first issue. Second issue, was KDOT negligent in not repairing a damaged highway fence? And that ties back into the first argument because they're saying, well, no, we don't have a statutory duty to maintain a cattle tight fence, therefore we can't be negligent for failing to maintain a highway fence. Well, this goes to the trial court, Kansas Court of Appeals, and the court said that KDOT does not have a duty to maintain cattle tight fences. Highway fences are to control vehicle access to the roadway, not to keep livestock in. Therefore, KDOT not negligent for not repairing the damaged highway fence. There was no evidence that the cows escaped other than through the unfenced culvert, and KDOT has no duty to fence off mouths of culvert. Uh, the trial court had ruled against KDOT and given the plaintiff a judgment of about 1.2 million. That got reversed. This went on to the Kansas Supreme Court. Kansas Supreme Court reverses the Court of Appeals reinstates the $1.2 million jury verdict, state has a duty to maintain highway fences to keep livestock off public roadways. That means it's gotta be a legal and sufficient fence. It's not just there to restrict vehicular access. So the state had to pony up a million two in that wrongful death case. That was a key case back uh, in 2001, okay? Now, we had a more recent one, May 24 and 22. This occurred on I-70 near Goodland. You had a husband and his wife that were about to Denver for the stock show. They were from Indiana, and they were heading back from the stock show in Denver on I-70 at night. This is why it's in federal court. We have a jurisdictional issue here. We have diversity of jurisdiction, so it ends up in federal court. Uh, you had it on an interstate highway with people from Indiana injured in Kansas. We're going to get into federal court on that. Accident was on I-70 near Goodland. Plaintiff was traveling 80 miles per hour at night with some visibility issues. 
and there was a dead cow in the interstate. The thinking was that it was a semi that had hit the cow, probably didn't realize what had happened, just kept rolling. Now you got the dead cow in the interstate. Here comes the guy in the F-150 going 80 miles an hour at 2 in the morning and hits that and uh, rolls the truck and is injured and you've got negligence and comparative fault claims and the defendant the, is a cattle company uh, was denied summary judgment on the negligence claim. They were saying, look, we were not negligent. We think somebody left a gate open. We don't know who that was. Uh, none of my employees did, we didn't, we can prove that. But they were denied summary judgment on that, meaning the court's going to allow that to go to trial on that particular issue as to whether they can prove uh, that issue. There was partial sh summary judgment on comparative fault based on this, this theory that there was an unknown trespasser. And also, based on the Reynolds case I just showed you, the court said the Department of Transportation did not breach its duty of care because the highway fence was in good shape. That's one thing KDOT will do. They will make sure that the, the fence along the interstate they're, that they're responsible for is a good fence. It's always well maintained. It's the other state highways where it may be an issue, but they always pay attention to the interstate uh, fence. So that's a, an issue that's out there. Uh, that case uh, is still going on. We don't have it concluded yet, uh, but that was the most recent fence law case on that particular issue. Okay, I know you don't have any questions and you want to get home. So. Right.